Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the next session, uh, which is about uh, new storage for Keycloak. And it will be presented uh, by Michal Haas, who is a uh, core developer leading Red Hat uh, data grid integration in the new Keycloak storage. And uh, Hinek Mulnarjik, uh, who is a Keycloak maintainer leading work on Keycloak storage refactor. Uh, one note, if you would like to ask the uh, questions uh, to the presenters, please uh, use Q&A section uh, here in Hopin. Uh, thank you, and the stage is yours. Uh, thank you, Lubomir. Uh, so welcome to this presentation, guys. Uh, this is going about uh, storage for Keycloak. And let's start right away with some brief introduction of what Keycloak is and what is what it is using for storing the data. So Keycloak is an identity and access management solution. Uh, it means that it provides basically a secure way for authenticating and managing users for applications. Uh, for this, it uses uh, well-known protocols, OpenID Connect2 and SAML2, and it also provides single sign-on functionality. Uh, what does it mean? It means that if you have more applications that are all connected to Keycloak, uh, it should be enough to just log in once and you should be automatically logged in to all of them. And uh, here is a screenshot from our management console. Uh, the management console is used for managing managing all the settings for Keycloak. Uh, so it it manages data about, uh, about Keycloak settings, about application settings, uh, about some access control right, like roles, groups, or about the users. And on this slide, I would like to show you some uh, quite common use case, uh, how the Keycloak is used. It's important to know there that this is just a simplified, uh, simplified diagram. Uh, usually, it consists of a few more steps, uh, which are, uh, which are uh, de depending on the protocol that is used, so either SAML or OpenID Connect. So, it works something like that. Uh, so first, the user access uh, using his, browser, his or her browser the application, and the application don't doesn't know uh, the user, so uh, it redirects the user to Keycloak. And now Keycloak needs to check whether the application is known uh, and whether whether he's managing it. And if yes, uh, it displays a login form uh, where credentials are. Yeah, inputted by by the user and and then Keycloak needs needs to check whether the user is known. So it connects the database again or uh, contact database again and ask is this user known. And if no, it may even happen that uh, if some external source is uh, uh, configured, it can ask even LDAP whether the user is known or some other external source. And if everything uh, checks out. Uh, the user is redirected back to the application with a successful login, login flow, and the application shows the protected page uh, to the browser. Uh, as I said, this is just a simplistic uh, uh, diagram that shows how Keycloak is using database or source or that data store, and it may be much more complicated, and all of these needs to be or how the you, how the key cloak should uh, approach this is stored somewhere in in the store so what are we using for storing all this data uh, currently we have a relational database that are storing most of the data but some of these data are also stored in an embedded infinispan mostly due to clustering purposes and this embedded infinispan is used for caching as well and it is uh, it is possible to configure for certain cases also uh, some connection with an external source. So for example, LDAP or Kerberos. And all of this needs to be stored in quite complicated data model, uh, which looks like this. And now if you are familiar with Keycloak, uh, you know that almost everything is associated, associated with a realm. Uh, that is why the realm uh, is here in the middle and there are so many associations out of it. And uh, the data model like this has some disadvantage and it is that if we want to update it, it usually requires downtime because we need to stop 
the old key cloak, then migrate uh, migrate the database uh, to a newer schema, and then start the new version. So with this approach, we started hitting some walls and we started to think about, about new store. And we've, we formulated following points as our motivation. So we want to allow user to, uh, to leverage uh, any storage technology they want for storing or caching data. And for this, we also want to simplify the data, the data model. So we would like to split the model into some logical errors. And we also want to allow users to store only, uh, to use different technology for each error if they want, or they even maybe want to store everything in one, uh, one uh, storage, it would be also okay. So if we want to split these errors into more storages, we need to have some loosened relationships between between those errors because uh, if um, because if one entity is stored there and the second one is not, it may uh, end up with some broken referential integrity or something. And and yeah, we want to allow users to, for example, store uh, users in uh, in the relation database because the users are quite often queried and, and there may be a lot of them and but if there is only some fixed number of application uh it's it is probably okay to just store this fixed configuration in in some static storage maybe files or github or something and last but not least we want also to support no downtime upgrades because if we if you have a uh, if you have a uh, structure or uh, infrastructure that is relying on uh, key cloak with authentication, uh, it usually means that if uh, key cloak or single sign on solution is down, uh, the whole infrastructure is down because you know no user can authenticate and no access control can work. So with this motivation in mind, we revisited our current storage. And we came up with following uh, ideas how to how to make this work uh, how we want. So uh, we split split the model into ten independent errors, and we ended up with data model like this. And now each rectangle on this slide is basically a separate error. And you can see that there is uh, much less tables and less connections between those tables. Uh, this is because we the normalizer schema and we allowed some uh, some tables or some data to be stored directly in the parent and it's important to know there that if someone wants to still preserve the referential integrity or still want to preserve all the relationship relationships between data it can be done uh, but we allowed uh, losing these relationships and uh, if we do it this way, that we lose all relationships, it is possible to leverage a different storage technology for each area. And since there are less tables, uh, we also minimize the need for downtime because if we update some data, it doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, that the schema uh, will change. Uh, then uh, we were think thinking how to provide this no downtime upgrade support. And we came up with the following requirement, which is the, the one that is minimum requirement is that we need to achieve that it is possible to run two adjacent key clock version in the same cluster. So what does it mean? It means that if we have a cluster of nodes with key clock version four, for example, it is possible to spawn a new key clock version five uh, and next to, to those previous nodes and it should work together uh, and it should uh, cooperate together using the store in a state uh, it was before update. This means that uh, key code version 5 needs to be able to read all the objects that are, that are already stored in the database. And it may even happen that there are some other, other objects that were not, were not created by key code version 4, but maybe key code version 1. So this needs to work as well. And it needs to work also the other way around that the <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, that these key clock version 
not for uh, needs to be able to read uh, all the data created by Kiko version 5. And this, given by the, the first requirement, it, we can be sure that there is only two edges on Kiko version running. So this requirement holds only for uh, two edges on Kiko versions. So Kiko version 4 doesn't need to, uh, to be able to read objects created by Kiko version 6, for example. And um, as, as you can see, the, the objects in the store are, are still, uh, when in the time of Kiko version 5 spawning, the storage uh, is still the same. So objects are not updated. Uh, these are updated only when it is written to them. So for example, if a user change, changes his or her username uh, the, and the request ends up in Kiko node version 5, uh, the old object is read, read and data are migrated, then the username is changed and the object in the database is updated to newer representation version 5. And uh, running the cluster in this way that there are a lot of objects with older version means that it, it can have some performance uh, impact and we want to allow uh, administrator to schedule some task uh, to some specific time where the objects will be read from the store and updated one by one. And, and yeah, and that, that's it for this. Uh, so the important thing to, to note on this slide is that storage version doesn't, doesn't necessarily uh, equals to key clock version uh, because on to explain this, I, I used the Kiko version 4, Kiko version 5. In fact, uh, this was basically a storage version, not Kiko version, because uh, even Kiko version 6 or 12 can still have storage objects or storage version 1 if there was no change between those releases. And even more, even ERAs can have a different uh, versions because, for example, if there was updated in user schema, uh, the, the version was bumped, but if ROM stays the same, uh, the, the version can be still run. Um, okay, next requirement was to allow users to, to use storage they want from sto for storing their data. And for this reason, we, we wanted to simplify addition of new storages. And if you remember, or if you know Keycloak a little, it, it had quite a lot of methods to, to implement if you wanted to allow a new, for example, user federation. You needed, for example, to implement method get a user by ID or get a user by username or email. And we wanted to get rid of this and we introduced a few interfaces and these interfaces contains just a simple uh, transactional operations and, and then few bulk operations. And if we have a closer look, uh, how we were able to achieve this, how we were able to turn uh, these met these lot of methods that needed to be implemented before to just few methods from an interface, uh, few operations from an interface, we we needed to have a look at our uh, at our implementation before, and we had following layers. So the first layer was services. Uh, this services uh, layer is basically triggered by REST call, so it is like JAX address endpoints. And this services layer I was communicating directly with Keycloak storage layer, and this Keycloak storage layer were combining together uh, too many things, in our opinion. Uh, so one of the things was uh, session. This session has all the information about current Keycloak uh, uh, current Keycloak uh, run or instance. And then it has a uh, possibility to communicate with other components of Keycloak uh, or it has information about the current request. Uh, then on this layer, there is also this entity and this entity represents basically all the knowledge uh, about, the, about the underlying storage, which means uh, it, it needs to know how the data are stored how to communicate with the external system, and uh, how to query this system, uh, query how to build queries for this system. So, for example, in JPA, it's JPQL query, 
And then there are these models, and these models are basically a combination of session and entity. And this model uh, object basically provides uh, some logical operations, or, or it can make some logical decisions based on the data loaded from, from the storage and from the session. So yeah, this can be considered uh, a little bit as a spaghetti, and we would like to replace it maybe with, with some lasagna. <laughs> so we had a look at, um, at methods we had, and we found out that this is an example of one of the methods from JPA Realm Provider. As you can see that this method can be basically split into two parts. One part is this physical part, and this part know, uh, knows everything about the underlying storage. It knows the data structure. It knows, it knows how the data are queried uh, using this JPQL query. And uh, it returns just, uh, in this case, it returns strings, which is ID, IDs of roles. And then there is this uh, logical part, which is making some logical decisions based on the results from the database. So for example, in this case, if no role is found, uh, it returns now. And if, there, if any role yeah, is found, uh, it uses session for communicating with another component of eCloak, in this case, roles. And it calls method get role by ID. And it basically turns the storage data in this case, ID to role model, which is this combination of data from storage and session. And now we were thinking about this, and if we we are able to basically split each method we have into two parts, and the one of them will be the logical one, uh, which has knowledge of the session and which produces models. And an example can be, for example, map user provider. And then the second part will be only the physical layer, uh, which knows all the details about how data are stored. But the, this layer is not able to, to do any logical decisions based on the request. It just returns raw data. And by this, what we achieve is that the implementation of new storage or new storage implementation is easier because the user or the implementer doesn't need to implement the logical layer. Uh, it is it is enough to implement only physical layer and the logical layer stays still the same. Important here is to also that uh, logical layer cannot communicate directly with the storage uh, because it doesn't know anything about its structure. Uh, so yeah, we we changed uh, this spaghetti into the lasagna. And so how the physical layer looks like. Uh, it has just a few interfaces, as I said before. So one of them is map storage. And this map storage has only one method, which is create transaction. And then this transaction contains all the, all the methods I mentioned before. So it has some single object operations and then some log operations. Uh, you probably noticed that the update method is missing. Uh, from, from these operations, and this is omitted on purpose because Keycloak is built in a way that it counts, or rely on the fact that all objects returned from the storage are in some way live objects, and any change to this entity returned from storage should be automatically propagated to the storage on commit. And then there are these uh, bulk operations. These bulk operations takes some criteria and this criteria basically represents some logical request. So it may be give me a user by username or give me a user where email starts with M or something like that. And by this, uh, this is basically all we've done. And here is an example how this works out all together. So, if there is a browser and it is doing some request to, let's say, give me a user by ID from Realm A, this such request lands in user's resource. And this user's resource uh, is then able to call a logical layer. This map user provider represents logical layer. And there is a method get user by ID. 
And now the responsibility of this logic layer is basically translate this logical request to one of the methods from the previous slide. And in this case, it results in read by ID. And now this map storage is implementation of some specific storage. So it can be translated to maybe SQL select or LDAP query, or if the data are stored in memory uh, in a Java map object, it can be a simple get call. Uh, then entity is returned. These, these are the pure data that are stored in the database. These are returned to logical layer. Now this logical layer creates this user model, which is a combination of session and the data. And this layer is also doing some logical decisions based on the data. So it can, for example, check whether the user really belongs to Realm. And this is then returned back to the user's resource. And this user's resource just returns uh, some JSON data back to, the, back to the browser. So to summarize what we have done, uh, so we simplified the data model. We split it into uh, logical areas. Uh, and we allowed only loosely coupling between those areas. We separated our key clock storage layer into two parts. One is logical layer and, and physical layer. And we simplified implementation of custom storages. Uh, it is enough to implement the only the physical layer, and there are less methods, only few operations. And we prescribed some rules for uh, how the implementer should should follow what what rules. We prescribed the rules that implementers should follow to, to achieve no downtime upgrades uh, functionality. And now maybe you are asking about composability. In the previous, in the first slides, I said that uh, Keycloak needs to compose data from more sources. So for example, from database and LDAP. And uh, it was a, it was possible previously, but now if we ripped the key clock storage layer into two parts, it's, it probably won't work. So uh, we, we found out another way, and this will be part of the next presentation presented by Hinek. So do you have any questions? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, great, sorry. Uh, I had a connection issue. Uh, so uh, I see there uh, several questions in the Q&A section. Um, okay, uh, I would uh, start with uh, all this one. Um, so will there be a default implementation which is based on the same logic as today with a relational database in storage layer? Uh, yes, there will be. We are working currently on uh, basically two implementation. One is JPA, and then the second one is Hadrod. And uh, each can be used separately on its own. So it will be basically, it is possible to use just the relation database with preserving all, all the referential integrity as it was before. But with maybe with a little bit different schema. Sorry, not little. Mm, okay. You have a different schema. Uh, there was one question, I think, uh, regarding uh, the previous uh, slides, and this uh, was require porting of existing user storage provider implementations to uh, use with future key clock versions, or is a map user provider just a different way to do it? I can take uh, this one. So uh, uh, user storage provider uh, is uh, based on the implementing the operations on the logical layer. That means uh, once that uh, you have to deal with the session, make sure that all the uh, data is transferred properly into the models and you work with the models uh, in that provider basically. 
uh, we wanted to uh, remove this requirement. Uh, I will speak about that uh, later on in the tree storage part. Uh, but uh, I'm sorry, there was some something that has happened there. Um, uh, but uh, basically, to be able to allow extensibility, not only for users, but basically for any other areas, we will uh, rewrite this extensibility. I'm not sure whether there will be user storage provider uh, replacement, direct replacement. There will probably be a need to uh, revert, uh, refactor uh, the user storage provider into a map storage uh, in the future. We would like to get rid of this very specific user storage provider because then we don't have any group storage provider. We don't have any client storage. Well, we don't have any role storage provider. Client storage provider is kind of uh, hacked uh, in there. Uh, but uh, other areas are not possible to extend. So we want to make it uh, uh, consistent with all the other areas and uh, thus re-implement the user storage provider. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, there is the next question. Uh, is it possible to build implementations today? Are there example implementations then uh, we can look at? Yeah, I can take this one. <clears throat> it is possible to, to do implementation today. Uh, we already have, as I said, JPA and hot rod, and it is already in main, and it doesn't cover all the entities yet, but we are working on this now, and it, it should be finished, let's say, soon. Let me add one more thing on top of that. Uh, there is a full implementation in a memory implementation in concurrent hash maps, uh, which can be which can serve as a sample, but we are not there yet with the documentation. So you can have a look there. Uh, you can try it uh, with Wildfire distribution. There is a script in the examples which allows you to set up uh, uh, using the concurrent hash map map storage. And we are working also towards the documentation so that we are able to pass on this uh, to the community as well uh, to get better uh, feedback. Okay, thank you for your answers. Uh, there is the last question and uh, this, uh, if you break up the storage into different implementations, uh, how will the transaction semantics be? Let me take this one. Uh, this one is actually very tricky. And uh, uh, thanks a lot for this question. Uh, the transactional semantics is uh, ideally, if we had, if all the storages had uh, XA transactions, uh, we would be uh, much better off than uh, we are able uh, to do even with the current storage. Because for example, if you go to Alda, LDAP has no transaction uh, semantics at all. So uh, we are doing our best efforts there. It uh, is very similar with what we are doing with InfiniSpan. We are still trying to do our best, uh, not necessarily using XA transactions because these are uh, performant, uh, inefficient, uh, performance inefficient. However, uh, I, I will uh, speak about that slightly or touch on that slightly also in the next presentation. But the uh, transaction, if you keep it only on the level of a single database, would still be a standard database transaction. So uh, if you keep your data source in that single database, you can still rely on the old uh, transactional semantics because the transaction, if you crafted in a proper way would be shared across all the areas. There will be only a key cloak transaction, which would refer the same database transaction coming from different areas. So basically the transactional behavior will be there. Thank you. Uh, there is one more question. 
And uh, it is uh, how breaking changes of the storage physical layer are handled to provide uh, no downtime. downtime. Uh, assuming that uh, this translates uh, to storage uh, breaking uh, change too. I'm actually not sure I follow uh, completely. Uh, how breaking changes of the storage physical layer are handled to provide no downtime. Let me uh, answer it uh, slightly wider. So storage physical layer, uh, the implementation of a storage physical layer has to handle no downtime upgradability by itself. Each of the uh, storage implementations has to uh, respect the rules that were stated there by Michal. Uh, and uh, then it would be possible to get no downtime uh, upgradability. However, these rules are not the only ones. And if you come up in your implementation with uh, whatever other rules that would guarantee the non-time upgradability, you are definitely free to go with those. Because the no downtime upgradability is really hidden in the details of the implementation of the map storage. So from Keycloak perspective, from the perspective of services, this is completely hidden. This is a layer below uh, that uh, the services can see. I hope that answered the question. If it's not clear, under Apple, free to put another question, <laughs> or you can discuss it also after the session. Uh, okay, I don't see any more questions right now. So please uh, go on and you can continue if uh, there are not any more questions. Apologies, that was a wrong tab. I will try to share the right tab at this moment. This one, yeah, that should be it. So uh, welcome everyone who has joined uh, uh, since uh, Michal's talk, uh, I would like to speak about the tree storage, which is basically a storage composition. And I uh, uh, would like to warn you in advance that this talk will be really a deep dive. And one more thing, uh, tree storage, contrary to map storage, is only partially in the code base. It's still under construction. So here, here what I'm presenting is uh, the current state of the art, and I will be uh, glad if you provide me with any kind of feedback, for example, on GitHub discussions, uh, that would be perfect. Or obviously after the talk uh, in, the, uh, in the area that we have for this. So uh, tree storage is about uh, the composition. And Michal already uh, showed some example, and I will uh, go through that example to answer the question whether the composition is really needed. So that's uh, the motivation slide that you've uh, already seen slightly amended. So uh, the setup is uh, again the same. So there is a browser. It wants to get some uh, application uh, page that's protected. And it reaches out to Keycloak, and Keycloak checks uh, whether this application is known. So it would actually get to the database. Uh, that's one thing. So once it learns uh, the uh, client, uh, it would ask for the username, password, possibly. And then after getting some information, it would uh, check whether this user is known. And it would check actually two sources, database and LDAP. And uh, note that these two sources means that there is the same object being composed from two data sources. Uh, it's even it gets even slightly more trickier if you go to the uh, two-factor authentication. Then two-factor authentication details parameters are not actually stored in LDAP. Well, they may be, but usually you would get it from the database, and uh, 
you would still speak about one and the same object, one and the same user. Uh, so uh, only after you get these data and uh, see the full uh, contents of the user, you would be able to obtain what parameters you should be using for that particular user. And eventually you get to uh, the protected page, uh, which would be served by the application or not if you don't know the two-factor uh, properly, second factor properly. So the current uh, architecture, uh, I'm slightly repeating what has already been said, but there may be some of you who weren't here in the previous talk. Uh, the current architecture leverages embedded InfiniSpan and relation database. It is important to realize that the InfiniSpan and the relation database, uh, both they are in uh, two uh, different roles. The InfiniSpan works as a cache for certain areas, for example, to cache some user data, but it also uh, works as a persistence layer uh, for example, to store the sessions and share the state across the cluster. Relation database, uh, it's uh, kind of uh, similar. Mostly it's used for the persistence. But if you have uh, some user federation, for example, in LDAP or your own custom user federation, then it may be set up so that it caches some of the data. It keeps synchronized uh, state of that particular user federation with the data that's stored in the database. And in that way, it serves as a form of a cache. Uh, in the current architecture, there is uh, exactly this user storage provider that was mentioned uh, in the previous question. And uh, uh, there is a support thus for extending user storages. But as I talked about that uh, in, the, in the answer, the implementation is basically on the logic layer and has to deal with uh, many, uh, let's say boilerplate code uh, that uh, turns what is stored in the data into what is expected uh, by the uh, key cloak services. Uh, that is the model. There is some limited ability for extension of clients and there's no ability to extend uh, other areas that is roles, groups, events, whatever, uh, no supported. And we wanted to actually uh, change that a little bit with the map storage. But as we see, the composition is necessary. So we need something uh, more. We want to leverage any map storage, be it your implementation, Keycloak uh, implementation, and somehow stack it on top of each other. So for any custom storage from any area, that means you would be able to uh, have your groups, you would be uh, have your custom implementation of role storage. Uh, you would be able also to leverage uh, what is offered by Keycloak and just implement it on the physical layer. That means uh, your implementation should be kept simple. So uh, here we come to the tree storage. Uh, tree storage is a tool for organizing map storages into a tree. So imagine that you've got uh, an admin who would like to have uh, this uh, layout of the storages. There would be a cache uh, realized by an internal InfiniSpan or hot rod connection that would uh, get its sources from source data from two uh, uh, data sources, ultimately an LDAP, which because it only contains a part of the object has to be supplemented uh, by some JPA, for example, JPA would uh, only contain the attribute values and from a REST. Well, that maps basically to a tree. If you check the uh, colors, they should be matching and you can see how the tree is organized uh, on the picture below. Of course, you can have another layout. If, for example, this REST uh, 
uh, calls also don't contain everything and they are on par uh, with LDAP, then you would like to have uh, those uh, attributes supplemented by the JPA as well, also for that REST uh, storage. Importantly, uh, now that we've got uh, map providers, uh, we require we are able to uh, plug into any map storage. And importantly, tree storage is itself a map storage. So it is an implementation of a physical layer. And uh, that simplifies uh, plugging it into, uh, into Keycloak itself, because plugging in map storage is already there. Now, when I mentioned that uh, there is a user, uh, there is ultimately some store that decides whether the user is or is not there at all, whether it exists. I'm not speaking now about the properties, about the email's name or whatever, but whether the user itself exists. And that is in the tree storage, uh, one of the leaf nodes. So if there is an... Uh, need to decide whether uh, an object exists, it ultimately would get uh, to one of the leaf nodes. Which one? That's uh, something to be discussed later on. The inner nodes, like this one, can cache some of the fields, or they can supplement uh, the object that it retrieves from the uh, storage be below with some additional fields, as we have seen in the previous example with the attributes. We are also, uh, uh, we will need uh, the concept of an authoritative node. Uh, the authoritative node is tied to a search criteria. So it is a node that may contain object in its store, each of the nodes is uh, tightly uh, uh, coupled with a single uh, storage. So if it can contain an object from that store, now uh, then uh, it would be an alternative. So let me get uh, to an example. For example, here, uh, if we search by a username, then uh, we would search LDAP and skin directly in this case. and. If we search by some attribute, and now here we are assuming that uh, scheme contains the full description, including the attributes, then it would be actually uh, these two nodes that would be uh, authoritative. This authoritative node is a uh, important concept uh, to, uh, to keep in mind. And one more thing, uh, that is related to the tree storage is uh, there are some properties that are applicable to a storage that in the current view are uh, all uh, stored at the same place as they are, for example, connection properties uh, uh, as, the, as they are some properties for, for example, synchronization that are generic properties uh, that relate to any uh, storage. So uh, now with the tree storage, there is a distinction between the uh, properties that are specific to a particular storage and properties that are specific to the structure. Do I want to, for example, uh, validate each object that I read from some cache? If so, then it is not a property of a particular storage. It's not something that relates to a connection itself. It's something that relates to how this tree is actually processed. So it is a uh, property of a node or edge. I'm not going into details now. Similarly, for, for uh, a read-only storage, you would use the same implementation as you would for a read-write storage. Just mark in the note that this storage is a read-only. Now, 
to understand a little bit more about what is the uh, anatomy uh, and how these compositions really work, we need to get uh, into the entities. And this is going to be uh, interesting. In the physical uh, map storage implementation, the entity is the Java representation of the raw object. The raw, I mean, there is no models referred. Uh, for example, in the user entity, you wouldn't find uh, give me a row, but you would find give me a row ID. Uh, so if we uh, replace this uh, Java code that you may be familiar with, uh, with a picture, which will be used for the next, of the next presentation, for the rest of the presentation. The map user entity is basically something uh, that is here uh, marked in the dashed, uh, dashed line. Now, uh, we will have two kinds of storages. The first one is simply a native storage that contains everything that's in that particle entity type. For a user, you would get in a JPA uh, every single uh, property uh, stored in some model. What type, what type of model it is, is irrelevant for this part. Um, there is another type of the storage that is the partial storage. And a perfect example is exactly the, the LDAP that we have uh, seen earlier. So LDAP, uh, it contains just a few properties. How do we make a map user entity out of these properties? Obviously, we have to map it somehow. And now that is uh, becoming uh, very interesting. So in the node, uh, we store, yeah, so uh, I should probably say it, said it slightly differently. So uh, we would uh, turn the JPEG photo and street into two attributes, street and photo. And we know that this LDAP doesn't contain anything regarding the required actions. So what we need is uh, to store in the node the status of the entity field. We know that, that the LDAP needs to uh, spit out uh, objects of these uh, of this type map user entity, and we know that only few of them are really filled. So we have to keep track of those, and that is exactly what we are doing here. The node keeps track of the status of the field. So that there is a primary source. There is primary source, with, which may be also partial. That is for the attributes, street and photo, nothing else. And then there is also the information what is not handled by that storage. I'm sorry, Zach, uh, so in Trapegude, you have just two minutes left, so. Yeah, yeah, I'm That's going fine. to be very fast. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so what happens is that uh, we have this entity uh, composition and uh, we have a native map storage that is able to supplement the missing attributes, the missing fields, uh, by keeping track of the identifier of the uh, lower, uh, lower object in, let's say, LDAP in the JPA, and also be able to say what exactly the uh, fields are uh, what fields are stored in JPA and which fields are stored in LDAP and then act accordingly. Uh, I will keep this uh, for uh, you to uh, check in the uh, attached presentation to the uh, to this uh, talk. And I will skip uh, this. We uh, I will just get to the read operation. So if we have a read operation that is able to read exactly from the very first, very top uh, element, uh, then 
it would be able to retrieve exactly this object. Now, if we want to get a username from this object, we know that the username has been cached from LDAP, so it can be written immediately from this object. If uh, a setter is called, though, uh, then we know that while this is cached, it needs uh, ultimately change in LDAP. So we lazy load this LDAP object and then change the username there. We don't change it in the LDAP itself. That's related to the transaction properties that you uh, asked earlier. Uh, but upon commit, we write it through into LDAP. I probably will skip this one as well because it's uh, just a generalized, uh, generalized example. Uh, just let me quickly uh, go to summary. So uh, we uh, in the map storage uh, need few more, uh, uh, few more operations that would uh, keep the linking between the uh, individual original and uh, supplementing objects or caching objects, depending on the use some validation on in, and invalidation. And uh, basically that's uh, what, uh, what is possible to fit into this presentation. So Lubomir, if you want to take over, uh, feel free to. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for attention. Thank you very much guys uh, for your presentations. Uh, it was really great. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, end of uh, the session. Uh, we don't have uh, too much time for the or uh, we don't have uh, no, uh, any time for the question and answers. But uh, if you want to discuss anything, uh, feel free to go to Discord or uh, you can move on to uh, the work adventure. Uh, this is a great virtual pro platform uh, and where you can interact with each, with each, with each other. So uh, feel free to go there and you can discuss anything uh, related to this, uh, uh, to these presentations. Uh, thank you again uh, very much.